Um, so we're kicking off with panel one, financing a green transition, reinforcement or reduction of global inequalities. We want to explore tensions between domestic economic policy and understanding of green colonialism globally, centering on the big picture problem of scaling up financing for a green transition and the new mechanisms to ensure funds towards climate vulnerable nations, oh, that's not the right page, <laughs> sorry, uh, which often bear the brunt of economic degradation, despite being the least responsible for ecological breakdown. We will be coming to issues of the international financial architecture in the next panel, so I'd uh, you know, try and keep this panel constrained to, to this problem. Uh, and, and to introduce our three awesome panellists, first of all we have uh, Priya Luca, who is an economist in international development, working globally to understand alternative realities and perspectives to neoliberalism through raising awareness of communities working for repair and reparations, which is also the focus of her PhD inquiry. Priya's most recent work as a macroeconomist covered the region of Asia and at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN and as a Chief Development Economist for Christian Aid. Dr. Kirsten Perry is Assistant Professor in the Department of African American Studies at UCLA. His research focuses on race, reparations, plantation economy, colonialism and climate change, Caribbean political economy and economic history and global finance and governance. He's currently working on a book on plantation imperialism, climate reparations, and the implications of cascading ecological and economic calamities for radical humanism in the Caribbean. And Dr. Elias Alami is Assistant Professor in the Political Economy of Development at the University of Cambridge. His interests include political econ ecology, the political economy of money and finance, state capitalism, north-south relations, financialization, and the articulations between race, class, and coloniality. He's the author of Money Power and Financial Capital in Emerging Markets and the co-author of The Spectator of State Capitalism, which is coming soon. Kirsten, can you come to you? Sure, thank you so much, Fran. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers here at UCL. Uh, Katie, thanks so much for having us. Um, and to Tracy and I believe Anna for the work, hard work in bringing us here. Um, I want to give a, f a sort of brief understanding of what my work does. Uh, I try to develop in, in my work a sort of structural economic analysis rooted in Caribbean reality and experience, especially among the African diaspora, and seek to offer new tools. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about what, how we can arrive at some of those tools. Um, to interrogate better the experiences of the most marginalized facing uh, some of the sort of multiple ecological, economic, and political crises of our times. Uh, the Caribbean is well placed as a theater for many of these crises happening at the moment. And it's important to understand the history of the Caribbean as central, first and foremost, to industrial capitalism. Right? I think it is important for us to understand that the Caribbean, as one place in which the most vulnerable countries to climate change reside, it's also because of their centrality to that process of capitalist development, that they, those countries are now facing many of these challenges. My analysis also looks at the ecological crisis uh, imperialism as central to ecological crisis, as a structural force that impinges on communities to respond effectively to such crises and also lead autonomous and liberate, liberated lives. From this perspective, I think there's a lot of talk at the moment about reforming the international financial system. I'm not going to go into detail about that. But what I want to point out is that how might we utilize development finance right, and institutional and policy levers, such as the re recent loss and damage fund, as a mechanism for reparations and transformation. However, uh, I think the international system and multilateral system actually is designed and was set up to do what exactly is happening at the moment. If you trace the history of the International Monetary Fund, 
of the World Bank, those institutions were not set up for, for countries that are most mar marginalized, oppressed from colonialism. Those institutions were set up for Europe. And it's important to understand why. Those institutions were set up to restore capitalist uh, uh, development in, in, in Europe, right? And to ensure that Europe remains at the top of the global hegemony. So I think, you know, without putting this call for reform in a proper historical context and viewing, fi and viewing financial measures as purely depoliticized tools, it leads us to very lackluster, suboptimal, and truly, you know, reforms that may perpetuate many of these injustices. While we might consider the state uh, as an important uh, assemblage of class and political interests, that is relevant to this idea of a green transition, and we can talk about this idea of a green transition and who is transitioning, who is not transitioning, and who is going to remain at the bottom of the, the ladder in that respect, we might consider the fact that the state may not be the source of liberation. The current form of the militarized repressive state must not only be abandoned completely, but must be abolished entirely and which requires a collective transnational effort built upon the long histories of resistance uh, to these forms of oppression in places like the Caribbean. At, at present, I think there is, also, there is also discussion around what development looks like and what uh, the current form of development uh, that, is very, that is financialized and also meant to uh, extract wealth uh, from regions of the world like the region, like the Caribbean I've talked about, but also what do, do the histories of resistance <coughs> to these various forms mean, that, so mean for these communities to ensure that they galvanize forms of creative expression and to ensure that those, those, the continued perpetuation of these kinds of injustices are overturned on their head. So when we talk about the story of development finance as a period, uh, during the period of, of decolonization, for example, often that story is told as one in which most countries had a very active state and was able to work towards the public and, the, and democratic interest. I, I want to suggest that that, that, that kind of homogenization of development experience is actually quite problematic. In fact, because the Caribbean is not one place in which where that kind of state-led development happened, except perhaps in places like Jamaica and uh, Trinidad and Tobago. So we have an, the idea that the post-colonial paradigm built upon this idea of state development and public regulation is critical. However, uh, as uh, my friend Assad was just pointing out, the case of Palestine has actually exposed the fact that this multilateral system that we have come to, and that some economists have come to believe in, actually is not supporting this broad transformation project that, we, that we're talking about. Take the case of Haiti. So Peter James Hudson has written this really important book on called Bankers and an Empire, and shows, for example, how European states, as well as the United States, which militarily invaded Haiti and occupied Haiti for uh, several years, stole its entire gold reserves, controlled its national bank, controlled its customs and other financial institutions. I'm using this historical example because often we don't turn to countries like Haiti to tell a story about the global political economy. Right? And it's important that we understand many, the, the entire financial architecture of the modern world was at, built, for example, things like insurance, banking, what have you, was actually built on chattel slavery. The banking system, right, and, and f from the Bank of England at one point, 
We also know that these institutions, financial institutions like the Bank of England, most of the governors of the Bank of England were actually enslavers at one point in time. So that history is absolutely critical for us to understand. One, we have to have a proper analysis, right? On the one hand, but then understand how might we overturn those systems that encourage and continue to stimulate those forms of injustice. And my friend Priya has also pointed out that reparations obviously is one, me one set of measures that is critical for overturning this extractive financial system. And one in which, in my view, cannot be, be held, cannot be, sorry, channeled through the state, but in fact, the potential for community governance of finance must be uppermost in our minds when we talk about how we move forward in terms of, of this idea of, of an energy transformation. Let me pull out my notes. Yes, all right, well, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm uh, really happy to be in this room and be part of this conversation. So my uh, remarks are in a somewhat, somewhat different register from the, the ones offered by the previous panelists, but I, I hope they can be sort of complementary or at least be in productive tension here. Um, so I think that in wrestling with the, the challenge of financing a green transition, I would argue that what we need to distinguish that what we need to do is to distinguish between private and state-led climate finance, uh, for lack of a better term. And a simple argument that I want to make here, and, and again, this, you know, I'm sure that many of you won't disagree with that, uh, is that at the moment, both modalities of finance, so again, private climate finance and state-led climate finance, tend to reinforce inequalities between and within countries. So we need to do something about both when thinking about uh, progressive macroeconomic policy proposals. So let me start with global private climate finance. So first, there's major problems of scale and speed at which private climate finance is mobilized. Uh, we all know that. But of course, you know, this ends up penalizing developing countries which are most exposed to climate change now. Secondly, almost all of it, so again, all of, almost all of private climate finance goes to climate mitigation projects uh, and very little goes to adaptation which again means that this penalizes those who are suffering from uh, the effects of climate change now. Thirdly, when we look at where private climate finance is going, almost all of it goes to rich countries, unsurprisingly. So for instance, most clean energy investment is going to East Asia, Western Europe and North America. Uh, less than 1% of uh, total private climate finance is going to uh, the least developed countries, and especially not to countries which are most affected by climate change. Fourthly, if we look at what kind of uh, private climate finance goes to developing countries, we can see that this finance is scarce, it's expensive, so you know it's common to see high cost of capital, high interest rates, high insurance premiums, and so on and so forth. So forth. Um, and those flows of private finance are volatile and tend to be quite procyclical. So again, they contribute to high debt servicing costs, debt distress, lack of fiscal space, and so on and so forth. So overall, private climate finance tends to reproduce, uh, if not to reinforce, the hierarchical and unequal structures and geographies of the global financial and monetary system. And I'm not going to say too much about that because this is for later or tomorrow. And again, this is at the expense of developing countries. Now, if we shift our attention from private climate finance to state-led uh, climate finance, the picture isn't much better. We see that rich and powerful states, which are the core, core of the world economy, have a much greater um, capacity to mobilize state-led climate finance uh, via things like green industrial policy plans, public investment, but also tax cuts, subsidies, grants, loan guarantees, and so on. So barring any substantial change, there's risks that this trend will continue, uh, meaning that we'll have rich and powerful countries with deep pockets, increasingly developing big, being big green states, uh, between inverted commas, while poorer countries 
may be confined to extractivism of both the green type and the not so green type. So, of course, this has implications for inequalities within countries as well. In the Global South, we know of the consequences um, of extractivism in terms of ecological destruction, indigenous dispossession, and extremely oppressive class structures. We know very well about all this. But in richer countries too, the development of big green states, if it does indeed happen, would take place in the context of intensified geopolitical competition and a general lack of economic dynamism globally, which means that this is increasingly making the green transition green transition, a zero-sum ga game scenario. So here the risks uh, are that this configuration will mostly benefit large firms which are capable of leveraging competition between states to capture green subsidies, grants, tax breaks and, and so forth, um, and other policies of state aid and corporate welfare. And there's also risks that labor is increasingly suppressed as part of this race to compete in the green transition with obvious consequences for inequalities. So to wrap up, um, the point I want to put to you is that ongoing modalities of both private and state-led climate finance risk at the moment worsening inequalities between rich and poor countries, but also within countries. And so the search for macroeconomic progressive policies must take these double aspects into account. Thanks very much. Thank